Okay, so hi everybody, it's Carl at Escape here, and today we have Johnny Hong on Escape Trailer Talk number four. Now, Johnny has, well, I've met Johnny before, obviously, when you came up to Vancouver that time. You came in and, uh, and we met and we talked through the trailer sizes. I remember at that time, I think you were on for an Escape 19, if that I recall. Right? Yeah, you're, you, were, you were in the showroom and you were kind of wandering around looking at the Escape 19. And then, and then you, um, you said, well, what about that 21 over there? <laughs> and you're sitting in your Escape 21. And of course, I'm following you and also sitting in Escape 21 here today. So, Johnny, how did you, I mean, you know, everyone has their story about how they, how they happened upon Escape or, or, found an, or found Escape and then sort of worked their way through the, through the journey. Would you mind uh, giving us a bit of history? Oh, absolutely. Um, as most campers, uh, we all started tent camping, and I've tent camped ever since I was maybe 14 or 15 back in 1974. Mm -hmm. I'm dating myself, of course. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, fast forward, um, you know, I, I used to live on a boat, uh, a fiberglass uh -huh. boat, uh, for 10 years in my 30s. And then, of course, uh, you know, I grew up, got married, and uh, and uh, ha had a, a daughter. And was and that so on on the boat? Was that like when when you were on the boat? Were you traveling or were you just living on a boat? I was living on a boat and and definitely did a little bit of uh, sailing up and down the coast. Uh, uh, I did a San Francisco trip once mm. down to Mexico. Of course, um, the. Um, the island just uh, off of the coast uh, of the Southern uh, California coast. It's called Catalina. Spent mm -hmm. a lot of time there. They ah. made a lot of movies there too, uh, back in the thirties and forties and fifties. That's uh, right. I remember hearing about that. Islands. Yeah. yeah. Uh, for the movie stars, hmm. Humphrey Bogart and uh, Doris Day and all those wow. movie stars. Yeah. Huh. So yeah, in my, in my thirties, I, I spent 10 years living on a boat. Wow. So I'm familiar with fiberglass boat. Yeah. Uh, and uh, after I had my daughter, uh, I continued tent camping. But uh, since I had a little girl, I wanted to be, um, I guess, a little bit more comfortable for her. Mm -hmm. So fast forward, she, we did, oh gosh, at least six to eight years of uh, tent camping. And then when she got it uh, to about, 12 or 13, I really wanted to make it comfortable for her. So I thought about getting a trailer. Now, my wife is not into camping at all. I understand. She, uh, uh, camping is a motel, you know, motel six for her. That's yeah. camping. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can tell you, Sharon is, I remember when, when we were, cause we, we were camping obviously from, from an early age too. And then specifically when we came to Canada, much more so like in Ireland in those days, camping wasn't the big thing. Uh, really and um you know we did it with the boy scouts and that sort of thing but then when we came to canada i mean yeah sharon sharon sharon's idea of camping is that you take everything from the house <laughs> you put it in the truck <laughs> you go and you set everything up at the campsite you know and it's just uh it's a different place that you can go to that she doesn't have to clean <laughs> was was uh, was her idea of it but she loves trailering Oh yes, yes. Has she traveled with you? Yeah, uh, yeah, on, uh, yeah, okay. yeah. We've been out in the we've been out in the trailer, so okay. she uh, she enjoys that. And we're away next week. We're going up. We're going up Whistler Way next week for. Uh, oh, that sounds like for fun. a week of fun, which will be nice. Yeah, some great. hiking, some biking, and uh, kayaking is the plan. Ooh, that sounds like fun. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, you know, for my daughter, um, because I've taught her when she was a little girl. Um, to not be a, uh, to be bothered by dirt bugs mm. or you know some of the inconvenience of camping. So when I bought this trailer, it was it was, it was quite a um, a step up. But uh, you know from the beginning, I, I looked into before I owned my Escape or looked into Escape. I looked at fiberglass uh, trailer because I'm familiar with fiberglass trailer. And uh, when I was just kind of testing the water i did go to um some rv dealership and have looked at some of the more traditional trailers i just was not as comfortable with those um looking at the the constructions of it um me being a boat owner understanding the integrity of a vessel 
um, I kind of translated that that mindset of requirement towards uh, you know my next endeavor, which was would be a um, travel trailer. Mm-hmm. I was just not comfortable uh, in in maybe pursuing a more traditional trailer. So I looked into uh, so I, I looked into I would say uh, a couple of the brands are the Scamp, um, Casita. Bigfoot, Oliver, and then of course uh, yourself, um, Escape. And what really set Escape apart was, I, I guess, it would be the uh, the following of the Escape owners. Mm. Uh, at the time, of course, before you joined um, the um, the Escape group, uh, the previous owner had quite a, I would say, a loyal following. And just reading through that really kind of helped me and gravitated me towards uh, looking further into Escape. And plus, I, I like the layout, the uh, the offerings, uh, and the customization um, as I learn more about Escape. So I, I, I think that's what the, what kind of, uh, steer me towards the escape, and then of course you had your ambas- uh, ambassador ambassadorship program, um, and I was lucky to meet up with um, after reaching out to escape, uh, reach out to a local owner who was very uh, generous about showing his uh, escape. And at the time, like you said, I, I was interested in the nineteen because I had my tow vehicle ready, um, and. Uh, so the 19 was the original uh, pick, yeah. but as, as you mentioned, uh, you know, I flew up there <laughs> uh, after I, I uh, spoke with Melissa. Um, please say hi to her, by the way. I will, for sure. She was wonderful. She, she really made it um, a great experience for me. Um, but uh, I, I guess flying up there and seeing the, the real – um, selection that you have um, that changed my mind, um, I, and I could tell you a little bit more about what changed my mind about the twenty one. Um, Go for it, yeah, yeah. So, uh, like I mentioned, I had already signed off on the uh, build sheet, but I told Melissa, I said, "Well, before I, you know, take such a plunge with all the customization, I, I think I'll I'll fly up there." And this is after I already saw the escape. Uh, through uh, a gentleman up north here in Fullerton and just wanted to see it myself. So I flew up to Vancouver, rented a car, uh, stayed at the hotel that Melissa had recommended and made an appointment with her. And uh, sure enough, after I walked into the showroom and looked at all of your models and uh, I sat in a 21, I just fell in love with um, the, uh, the layout and, um, and the overall uh, quality of, of the trailer. Mm-hmm. And uh, right there and then, after she came back down with the build sheet, I said, is it okay to switch? <laughs> and she says, absolutely, no problem. So that was, that was, uh, that was the beginning. Um, uh, she was su- such a sweetheart in dealing with me the weeks prior to the build sheet completion. Um, she was very patient with me because I was just, gosh, uh, agonizing um, frame, frameless window, and all of the the refrigerator options because I wanted a a, uh, a larger refrigerator mm. for the 19. I think the 19 at the time the standard was a smaller uh, refrigerator. It's a five uh, cubic foot. Yes, yeah, so I yeah. wanted the larger one. And in talking to her, I said, she said, well, if you go to the 21, the larger refrigerator was standard. Mm. So I am so glad that I did uh, make the visit. It helped um, definitely make choosing the, uh, the frame window versus the frameless window uh, much, a much easier, um, I guess, decision. Just being there in person. I, I literally, I guess you probably uh, saw me up there for about th- three hours. I think I spent at least three or four hours yeah. Yeah. in the showroom. You were so busy walking back and forth yeah. at the time. And then you finally introduced yourself. Um, and, uh, and I learned that you were, uh, you were uh, the uh, CEO of the company. 
I didn't know who you were at, at the time. <laughs> Because yeah. I did see Reese walking around. I yeah. I didn't know about the transition yet. But um, yeah, so that, that's the story about coming up to uh, selecting a uh, uh, Escape 21. That's right. It was, uh, it was, a, it was a, I, rem I remember distinctly meeting you. It was a pleasure. I remember I came down the stairs and I think we had a bunch of people milling around in the showroom at the time, the stuff. And I was just trying to make sure everyone was being looked after type idea sort of answer as many questions as you can to um, help people sort of um, get educated I think that's the real we thing for us. Were. yeah I was pleasantly surprised that you, you were you were so engaged in and uh, engaging and the fact that you actually maybe a year later you remember our conversation you mm. remember that I was uh, an engineer that I had uh, installed solar at my own yeah. home yes and yes. Um, yeah. at the Time, I, I remember uh, I had communicated to you that I wanted to install solar myself. And you said, okay, so if you're going to do that yourself, uh, I'm going to make sure that uh, the guys reinforce the roof for you. So, and, and I really appreciated that. Yeah. Yeah. Because when I got my trailer. All I had was the entry gland for the, um, the solar. And then that was perfect. I didn't have to drill any holes. And then I just went to town afterwards. And that's the main thing for us when it comes to when it comes to solar on the roof or anything on the roof. It's about getting the wiring in, because if we don't if we don't get the wiring in behind the headliner and behind, so in the in the roof structure of the of the trailer, a lot of people don't notice because they can't see it. And there's the fiberglass, but then underneath the fiberglass is like a ribbing. Yes, um, there's a ribbing, a, a a plywood sort of ribbing underneath it and then underneath that again there's like a shiplap board that goes over the top of it because this said uh, this headliner stuff doesn't like to stick very well and up to you know gravity will will cause it to sag that's a big challenge that a lot of fiberglass or a lot of trailer manufacturers have is headliner sag so we put that shiplap board up there and once that's in place then you're not getting any wiring behind it <laughs> and you won't pull that's wiring exactly. behind it so I, yeah yeah. Well, absolutely. I, I did see what you just described because I did uh, enlarge the opening where the um, mm. air conditioner used to be. And I, I think you already know I have a skylight in place, yeah. of my original uh, air conditioning. So I did see all the structural description that you mentioned. Um, it, it is very, I would say, um, I was surprised uh, that it was very well uh, uh constructed um, yes yeah. yeah we put we put a lot we yeah I, I would say within our trailer of course we you know we put a lot of effort into the foundation of the trailer i think that's uh you know from an engineering perspective you, you know it's it is the most important part to build upon is to get it right at the foundational level and then you can build on top you can build pretty much anything you want on top of that <laughs> within reason <laughs> Yeah, and it's interesting that uh, I want to bring up a point. So the boat that I had had very similar um, liners mm. uh, to provide insulation uh, between the fiberglass and the cabin itself. And I did have those delamination that you mentioned about, about mm. the headliner over time, it would kind of fall down. Now, uh, many of the escapes that uh, are on the form, the Facebook form that people have bought, um, I have not heard any of those type of issues uh, related to uh, ceiling falling down or anything like that. So um, that's no, it's, it's something that Reese went through in the early days. Yes. Yeah, in the okay. early days, he, yeah, he, he, I remember him telling me, Reese and I spent a lot of time together. Um, in the in those six months, you know, when we were transitioning, and uh, learned a lot about what he had sort of overcome technically to get him to where he was. A lot of it was trial and error, um, which is a little bit different to you know sort of maybe how how um, how we would approach sort of engineering problems. It takes just a little bit longer on the trial and error side of things, but that was this is one of the key things where he said he had he had had issues. With this, and then of course the other part that's really important is using the right type of glue, and the right the right type of um, you know contact adhesive, really what it is, to keep everything in place. And there's two layers of insulation. So there's the there's the poly um, polyethylene insulation first, 
that and white then, portion. Yeah, right? the white, which is actually now black. Oh, it's now black. Okay. It's now black. It's now it's now black. Um, it was always it was white for years, and I started getting black recently. Why did I start getting black? It's no, there's no difference in the in the material. It's all exactly the same. But I got black because ah, I know why. I got black because I was having an issue with the dark headliner foam. So that it's all on the back of the headliner. There's yeah. a there's it's so it's a dark foam. It's like a, a high graphite loaded foam. Yes. In in behind there, so it makes it dark in color. And um, I was having problem getting that foam. So we were going to have to go to a lighter a lighter color foam. And the problem is um the the trailer of course is is somewhat translucent and you would see lines in oh. the lines through the trailer oh. with the sunlight essentially coming coming through and uh and it was because the the polyethylene behind was white and then we were having to go to a to a lighter one so um in the end i i managed to get the <laughs> the darker one I had to go to a different vendor and we managed to find it but um it was yeah so we went to the went to the black and I, i'm thinking going forwards it gives me some more options on insulation if i have the black polyethylene in behind there and then the uh and then i won't have the lines or the striping going on it doesn't happen you know, to me. it must be a challenge for you guys uh, uh sorry for interrupting oh. it must be a challenge for you guys you know, to manage the supply chain of all of this material, you know, including the appliance. Mm. I don't know how you juggle all of this because uh, at, at my work, uh, you know, we, we rely on a lot of suppliers and we have a lot of supplier agreement in place. And we, because of the, uh, the business I'm in, a medical device industry, um, we partner with our supplier to ensure that they are in good health. Because mm. in some cases there are a single source supplier mm. and I'm sure you have a lot of single source suppliers um, that that you know you want to make sure you partner with and make sure that the supply chain is uh, you know is consistent so no very very true I mean it is a it is a challenge especially when you're single sourced it is a real challenge you, you need to um, ensure that the the vendor is not too reliant on you either like, so yes. you don't want so as much as we want this relationship to be be beneficial. I don't want you to be 100% only supplying to me um, because if something happens to me, you go down as well. <laughs> Absolutely. So, so the, the the whole, you know, looking after each other works both. It works both ways. Um, so my my whole strategy is, listen, we treat everybody the same way, regardless of whether they're a vendor or a customer or an employee. Everybody gets treated the same way right. with absolute, you know, respect. And, um, and everybody everybody's in the business and everybody has to make money or they're not going to be in business very long. Um, so we have to respect that as well. And it's all about, you know, making sure you get a good quality product when you need that product. That's so, great. And then providing the vendors with as much um, um, foresight as we can give them on the supply side of things and then working with them when things go wrong. You know, not just uh, casting things aside and jumping to the next vendor, which is what sometimes you see in typical, typical supply chains. But it's it's not too bad. I mean, we have a lot of vendors, and I try not to take on too many more at the same time. But um, you know, a lot of the vendors we use are are all supplying into the RV industry anyway. Okay. So they're kind of you know they're, they're used to the likes of us. They might be a bit smaller than who they normally deal with. But that kind of helps us as well because we're not taking that much product off them. So when it comes to challenges like we've had in the last year with um, with the supply chain side of things, I know some of the big boys are hurting very badly on the supply chain side. Well, we hurt a lot less because we take a lot less. And it's almost like, well, we can look after escape, but they only need 100. <laughs> so let's just give them the 100 because we're going to be shorting whomever Thor by, I don't know, 5,000. It's like, well... That's shortened by 5,100. <laughs> I, I don't know if they actually think that way, but at least that's the way we feel because we haven't been short that much. You know, okay. we've, had our, we've had some challenges, but we haven't been shorted that much. And I got a great team here on the supply chain side who, um, you know, it's really nice in a, in a very repetitive business. I mean, if you're a project business, it's different. 
can be very hard on the supply chain. It's always up and down, but a nice uh, repetitive, continuous manufacturing process. It's just the same stuff all the time that we're purchasing and bringing in. But it's still, you know, it takes us, I don't know how long it is in the medical industry. I know you know, you've got a lot more regulation maybe to follow, but yes. it takes it it takes me at least eight months to introduce a new product. Eight months? Yeah. We're about four to five years. Oh, okay. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> right. and, and and that's not the you know the pharmaceutical is even you know longer. Yeah, yeah, you, yeah, yeah. But but I mean, like, even if I get a new a new cooktop or I'm trying to get a new air conditioner or something, that can by the time I source one, determine whether it's um, going to be suitable enough, um, and then go through the whole you know supply chain negotiations side of things, yeah. get something in, test it, validate it, ensure I can put it into all the models. That we have, yeah, you're you're topping near enough eight months. So when we have when we, when we have supply chain challenges with whatever it is, the like when the medic with the cocktop recall, which yeah. turned to be much ado about nothing really in the end, um, you know, when they it was like, oh my gosh, I have to get something else. How how can I get something in that quickly and get it validated? So a large part of what we've been doing recently, and I brought a couple of more engineers on board here, is we've been looking at um, you know getting getting multiple products in that can kind of do the same thing so that, um, you know, if something happens to one, we can quickly flip over to the other. And it yeah. It was going. Boy, yeah, I understand some of the challenges you guys have to deal with, you know, providing a, a good, accurate forecast for your supplier so that they can, you know, set up their business accordingly. And I, I think what you're doing is perfect to have, you know, multiple sources, but then, you know, it, it cuts into, you know, uh, scale of economy, right? You know, yeah. buy 500 from this guy, 500 from this guy, you know, you, you're going to probably pay a little bit more. So um, yeah. I keep, understand all that. You're trying to keep everybody happy <laughs> all at the same time. It's like, oh, I got to keep everybody happy and uh, to keep to keep everything going, which is which is great. Now, in your trailer, of course, you, you, um, you know, you have the, the the capability and the and the the technical acumen to develop solutions for your your own needs or things that you just want to do. Yes, <laughs> I think more than anything um, for yourself. And, uh, and I know we we covered a lot of these in the the rally video that we did, but a lot of people watching this now don't know haven't watched the rally video, so. Would you take us through some of the key things you do? And while you're doing that, what Harrison's going to do when he's put, when he's editing this video together is he'll start to flash up the uh, things like your your refrigerator and your pop-up power uh, point and your uh, batteries and those sorts of things. Yeah, well, um, I guess it's not a matter of need for me. Um, some of the things that I've done, and it's really just for creature comfort, uh, matter of want. Um, I uh, definitely went um, on the side of, <laughs> sometimes I use the word obscene, uh, as far as, you know, my power capability. I have uh, equivalent of, I would say, eight Battleborn 100 amp battery, uh, which is about 10.2 kilowatt um, hour um, battery for those engineers out there who would understand. Um, I have a 3000 watt inverter that will run um, my toaster oven, my uh, uh, mini split AC, my microwave, and um, they could be literally running at the same time. And I would not have to worry about uh, tripping uh, the uh, the inverter. So I would say that uh, the way I designed my trailer, it was really for creature comfort. Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, I'm sitting here um, uh, on the side of my house uh, with the air conditioner running, not hooked up to shore power right now. My refrigerator is running. Um, I could literally make coffee, use my blender, um, and, and to have all the comforts of home. Now, I totally respect people that would like to camp, uh, you know, with the minimum. Uh, I did that for, gosh, you know, 45 years. Right. Yeah. At that point, I, I like some comfort. Um, <laughs> <laughs> You've done it. <laughs> you kind of like, I've been there, got the, uh, got the t-shirt. <laughs> Absolutely. And and I have a, a, a daughter that I just adore and I just want her to be comfortable 
when she gets out of the shower, I want a nice warm floor for her mm -hmm. because it's nothing right. like a cold floor, uh, you know, when you're camping or yeah. when you're just, uh, you know, at home. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So I have comforts that suits me and, uh, and I respect uh, the people that want to go uh, as, as minimal as possible. But do you think, see, I, sorry, I think that, you are simply just ahead of the times. You're you're kind of ahead of us by a few years. I'm not going to say lots of years. Maybe I'm thinking only a few years, because I had this idea, um, similar idea. Although I'm not electrical, I'm not, I'm not an electrical engineer. I don't have. I'm, I'm. You put mechanical things in front of me, I'll tear them down and rebuild, and I'll design and develop them all day long. But it comes. I'm colorblind, which I think kind of doesn't help because I saw I got pushed off that whole electrical path when I was younger and pushed into um i ended up in the mechanical side of things but um oh my train of thought there i, I think yeah I, I i had this idea a few years ago where i'm like you know you know the internal combustion engine eventually has to go away right eventually it has to go away and we see the um the rise of the electric vehicles and, and i think rise to me the what really kicks it is electric trucking when that yeah. kicks in, right? That's what's that's what's going to change the face of uh, the face of the planet, or face of transportation. Um, and I know because I was involved in the trucking side of things with high pressure direct injection natural gas engines, and just you know trying to use natural gas as a fuel source for trucking because trucking is what's predominantly on the road and predominantly putting up the um, you know the the gases we say are the off gases uh, the emissions into mm -hmm. the atmosphere. Yes. And, and sort of burning up all the while. I mean, they're going, you know, the objective of a trucker is if he could run 24 hours a day, he would. He would keep going because they're making money. You know, every mile that thing is is turning. And so I, I kind of, you know, I remember saying to the guys, I, man, I think we really need to develop a trailer that has the maximum amount of um, solar generation on it because it won't be long before we have electric vehicles pulling electric trailers lack of a better word and i even went i, I went wacky further and and uh, if i put it out there does that mean it's protected is protected or is in the public domain i think it's in the public domain but the idea of and we're not, not going to do this but the the idea of having um essentially a glider that's made with uh, the electric motor technology on a trailer so that the motors that are in the vehicle are also the motors that are are driving the trailer and the trailer has this excess solar charging capacity so you're charging up all the batteries that are in the trailer and yes. then the trailer provides assistive force to the vehicle so that the vehicle doesn't have to pull the 5500 or 7000 pounds you kind of share it between the two it's like a train i guess like it's just yes. a train yes. idea and um, but that you know this trailer can because because it's got more surface area to be able to charge it can then provide power into your vehicle for you that's kind of where my you know my idea was was going with also i think you're you're just a few years ahead in terms of getting your setup organized to to do what essentially i believe i want to do with um with our trailers in the years to come wow you will be so far ahead of the industry if you um if you decide to pursue that yeah, um, I think there's enough of us that understands the uh, the technology. Uh, I'm I'm in the uh, Facebook forum, and uh, there are a couple of guys out there um, that are, that are very similar to what I have going, mm -hmm. uh, but maybe in a small, you know, a uh, uh, lower scale. Mm -hmm. I have some crazy solar amount. I think I mentioned to you I have over 1,700 watts of of um, solar that's available to me. Um, just depending on how I want to figure it, and, and I think you 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 understand that I have sliding solar panels yes. front and back. Yes. Um, yeah. When I'm yeah. traveling, they they retract back, and uh, I maintain the trailer at a uh, at a constant temperature when I'm traveling through places like Las Vegas, mm. so that my bread doesn't get all wilty and and uh, other. That's all. Yeah. And I yeah. could pull over and make lunch and still be very comfortable. Yes. But when I'm at a boondocking location, I would just flare it out. And then my uh, my buddy who is a rock climber, he has a family, he also has a trailer. They could plug right into my trailer and run <laughs> their AC and their microwave. Um, 
And the Johnny Hong Power Company. <laughs> yes, right. I, I'm like a little oasis for them. <laughs> so you see a electric cord and a hose from my trailer to their trailer because I, I carry also about 80 gallons of water. Right. right. With so um, it, it's nice to have that capability. Um, and um, I, I th I'm a tinker and, and I love technology. I just always want to, uh, as an engineer, always want to solve problem. Um, mm. There's a need. Well, I have a solution for it. Mm. So that's kind of my mentality. You know, is it ever good enough for you? <laughs> You know, at this point, it is. Uh, you know, I don't have any immediate projects. Right, uh, it, right. It's pretty good the way it is right now. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, I'll, I'll think of something to to keep myself busy. I mean, <laughs> I, the pandemic definitely acceler accelerated many of my projects, uh, mm. and then of course the untimely. Um, a uh, failure of my domestic uh, refrigerator, and at the time, um, and I, I think I mentioned that in Facebook, uh, the service department warranty service was like six months out. Parts were not available. Yeah. So it it really helped uh, me to make the decision to transition to my um, dual compressor uh, refrigerator, which I I really love. By the mm -hmm. way, I think you're going to get a lot of requests. Um, from people that have seen my refrigerator want you to maybe install that. So I apologize we, ahead of time. <laughs> no, no, we, and we, we have a compressor fridge option now. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. From that's, right, that's right. The Norco. Norco. Right. Yeah. Very nice fridge. It's a very, a very nice fridge. They have a great reputation. Yeah. So we have the, um, the Norco compressor fridge now that we put in. It's not a huge uptake, but it's enough to, I think, get the ball rolling from people. I, I think it all, it all, a lot of it comes down to, getting the the charging and the batteries or the storage technology in place. And, um, you know, and letting cat out of the bag here, we are, you know, we're continuing to, you know, source, should we say, um, better battery technology than we are sourcing today with the strategy of trying to, well, we'll, we'll know whether they're going through certification at the moment. So we'll know in Q4 of this year whether it's a success or not. But if it is, then I hope to have the battery size, and um, which will then enable us, enable us to double the battery capacity on the lithium yeah. battery side of things. And they come with a heating element and all that sort of stuff to, to aid with the uh, regeneration and the, and the sort of low temperature performance of the lithium batteries. Perfect. Side of That's things. great. So that'll be that'll be really interesting if we uh, if that comes together. And I'm really, I mean, I, I loved your idea of the um, the panels on the roof. I I kind of wonder is there a um, wonder if we can get. I mean, is flat panels the best, or or do we do you know is it is it good to try and get some sort of parabolic arrangement that can can sort of you know, orient itself towards the sun to capture, to capture more. So these are all the things that go through. I'm all, always going through my head thinking, oh, what can we do? What else can we do? Oh, I got to the run. Okay, hang on. Let me go do that. Then I'll come back. <laughs> Think about more. Yeah, things. It, it, I'm, I'm sure, you know, that's great that you are thinking through all of these things and, and then weighing the, you know, the benefit, complexity and benefit, you know, it's, um, I opted for, I would say, simplicity. Uh, because I have so much power that I don't have to worry about mm. optimizing uh, uh, the the angle of uh, my solar panels. A lot of yeah. people with minimal real estate, you know, with minimal panels, do want to uh, maximize their power. And if they're at stationary for a long period of time, there is no reason for them not to angle it, you know, for maximum uh, collection mm. of power. Mm. Mm -hmm. But for me, I am, I have so much solar that I, you know, oriented flat and I, I get enough. Uh, like, and, right you're, now, and you're a pretty sunny part of the world too. Yes. Yeah. That helps. Um, currently I get maybe about 6.6 .6 times of my rated uh, power. So that means if I had a hundred watt panel, you multiply that by 6.6 .6 times, I'll get, you know, uh, 660 watts of uh, solar production per day during this time. And it can go, it goes up to seven times, but wow. like yesterday I calculated 
that, uh, you know, I produce 6.6 .6 times the amount. So if you have a thousand watts, you get 6,600 watts wow. you know, of, of solar output during yeah. the day to yeah. power all your um, needs. So, yeah. What would, it take, what would it take to charge? Do you have any idea? What would it, I, I must admit, I, I don't know this. I should go and look this up, figure it out. What would it take to charge your normal Tesla? Oh my gosh. So the Tesla, they're, um, one of the model I can think of is, it's the 80 kilowatt, um, mm. battery bank. Um, and that would take a long time. So if oh. you can imagine I'm 10.2 kilowatts and they're 80 kilowatts. Mm. So that, that's a lot. That's a lot of power. But um, how long, how long does it take? So your 10.2 kilowatts in was a total battery storage. That's the battery Over energy storage. Yeah, that's my battery storage. And my solar capability is uh, if I have my truck solar on and everything extended is uh, just under 1800, uh, like 1750. So if you multiply that by 6.6 .6 times right now or seven times, you know, I, I could totally charge my battery in one day. But I don't consume that much energy now. Yeah, but that's what, that's what that's what twelve by twelve kilowatts. I'm thinking seven by eight hundred. So yeah, it's under fourteen. So maybe 12, 12, 12 and a half kilowatts. Yeah, uh, it, it's crazy. So what I would definitely mm. uh, be able to do is definitely um, power all of my needs. Cook, you know. 20 toasts, <laughs> microwave a turkey, uh, and have air conditioner running and still have access to put energy back into the battery for at night to run, say, my floor heater. Yeah. My, you know, my uh, hot pot yeah. or something like that. I know I've, I've seen a couple of trailers in Australia that have, um, I'll use your word, obscene amounts of <laughs> energy storage built into them. Um, I mean, Australia is a great place for camping yes. and for technology development from a camping. Uh, South Africa is another one. South Africa and Australia, they both do it, um, do it very well, especially more South Africa. Well, actually, they both do it from the overlanding perspective. They're big into the overlanding um, style, which, again, forces them to, to drive higher um, solar capacity on their, um, on their trailers. Let's go, through the, let's go through the items that you put in again. So if I recall, you have your um, split system air conditioner your fridge compressor fridge you it's have your, a compressor yeah yeah you have your um heated floor heated floor mm -hmm. circuit um you've got a toaster oven yes a 1300 watt to toaster 1300 watt yeah, a proper toaster oven yeah uh, <laughs> yeah and that's hanging yeah that's the one that's hanging harrison will show us a picture of this that's mounted yeah. up above the um uh, where the range hood was Yes. Right. And you have uh, your pop-up, I guess it's not electric, but you have your pop-up uh, PowerPoint. Yes. You have that on the side. What did I miss? Obviously, you have a, a plethora of uh, solar panels on the roof right. all connected together. Uh, did I miss uh, anything? Yeah, my 20-gallon tank uh, internal water tank. Oh, right. Yeah. That's that right. comes in very handy for... And I think I mentioned this. I, I mentioned it in my Facebook post that uh, I went skiing in Utah with my daughter uh, in January. Um, hmm. Now I didn't, you know, go extreme into the the uh, the the really high altitude. I was at Cedar City, which is about six thousand feet. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, the temperature overnight was in the teens. Hmm. Um, my I, I kept my um, external tank, the the normal twenty eight gallon water tank, empty, but I kept water in the uh, internal tank that I have, and I had no problems at all camping in um, you know I, I would say you know winter condition uh, with the heated floor with um, my mini split actually uh, uh, reverses to provide heat. Oh, it's a heat pump. Yeah. yeah, it's a heat pump. So, yeah. so I, I was very comfortable um, it, camping in uh, in the, um, I would say, the heart of winter in January. Now, I know these things are not designed to to be four seasons, but I definitely am, I would say, um, 
you know, stretching it, stretching. Well, it. Yeah, uh, and it, and it's only because the the water lines, the the dump valves and the the dump lines are are exposed, and um, yeah, and they are they are what freeze. And um, whoops, I'm just trying to stop. They are what freeze. So hence we we say, oh, there's my wife speaking of the devil. Hi, Sharon. <laughs> 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 yeah, I understand. Yeah, you must have known you were on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I understand about the uh, the uh, um, what they call it the uh, the tra the traps. Um, yeah. Uh, so what I did was uh, at night, and and this is just like a precaution for me. Uh, I bought those one gallon um, uh, RV anti freeze, and what right. I would do is after my shower at night, I just pour like a, a little bit on it. Uh, at hmm. the uh, kitchen sink and in the bathroom um, uh, just uh, as a, a prevention because I do yeah. have spray foam and right. I really think the heated floor provides a uh, mm. very good um, uh, thermal energy to to keep the water line and also mm. all the piping underneath uh, warm. Mm. So my, my 150 watt uh, heated floor I think contribute to my capability of camping in the winter and not having those uh, water lines and drain. Um, How many people do you think are going to be asking me for that now? <laughs> <laughs> I go, Johnny's down in California. <laughs> He's setting up a business. <laughs> he knows how to do it. <laughs> oh my goodness. It, it's really, to be honest, it's, it was not complicated. Um, it, it was a very, you know, mm. I would say half a day installed uh, with the thin film um, layer. Yeah, of, uh, might be an option for somebody who is, um, it's interesting because it might be, did you, did you pull up the vinyl floor or did you just put it straight? No, it just yeah, straight on top. Like le probably less than a millimeter thick. Mm, okay. The thin film element. And I have it on my Facebook post. You know, I, I haven't seen many people with that on the Facebook um, on the Facebook page. It it would be a nice, it might be a nice solution for someone who's has set themselves up at a a full service campsite where they've got power. Yes, yeah, absolutely. All of the all of the features that I have uh, definitely are for uh, you know people that. Uh, favors campsites too. Um, yeah, the things yeah. like the mini split that's perfect. Yeah. That acts as a heat pump, and you then now can sleep in comfort without the noise of the traditional RV furnace because mm. that, that's pretty loud. Mm. Um, mm -hmm. and right now, everything is so. My air conditioner is running right now. You don't hear anything. No, very quiet. Uh, very quiet. It's the same thing uh, in the opposite mode, which is the heating. And what size? Um, what size unit do you have? What size, what? I have a nine thousand uh, BTU. Nine thousand BTU. Yeah, and guess what? It draws right now. I can tell you. Oh, I don't have my phone here. I could tell you exactly what my power consumption is of that mini split because right now that's the only thing that's running, and um, I can tell you that. It is drawing 452 watts. That's it for an air conditioner. Yeah. yeah. Um, initially, when you start it up, it will draw maybe eight 800 watts, but it'll taper because this is an inverter technology. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, so it's modulating. Yeah, it's modulating. Yeah. yeah, I know. Well, I know Dustin. Or Dustin. I know William is intrigued by the, uh, the split system stuff and something we're going to get on with here at some point he's of course back on the escape 23 now okay 20 the 23 up and running um but the 23 yeah maybe might be an interesting option still trying to push hard on this 23 we got the molds in for the 23 it's a nice it's a different 23 is very is very specifically for people who want that walk around bed and dry bath Arrange. That's that's why I <laughs> right, that's that's why I built it. It's or why I'm building it. Should I say I haven't built one yet? Um, but it's still a very small package. I mean, it's only 23 foot long. It's only just about the same length as our fifth wheel. Not a big unit, right? Not big. But but the you know the key thing that people are like is oh I don't want a huge trailer, but I do want to walk around bed, <laughs> yeah, yeah. and I do want to dry bath. 
And it's like, okay, well, and you can, you know what, Carl, if you can kind of squeeze everything in, maybe it's not optimal, but I, that's what we need. That's what we really need. So I, I think we're still onto a winner with the 23 um, going forward. It is a different design for us. And then a lot of the work that we've been doing over the last year and a half, I would say, from a design development perspective and things that are finding their ways now into the escape trailer, a lot of them are finding them in a standard. People don't see them, right? And I don't necessarily broadcast these, these mm-hmm. things either. We're just building improvements in all the time um, into the trailer. But a lot of them um, build into improving my ability to um, produce at better rate on the production line while maintaining quality, which is the key part. Yes. Like, you cannot speed up if you're going to sacrifice quality because it just hurts you all the way through. Let's not do that. Let's yes. do it right first time. <laughs> let's not, let's not, yeah, let's not just enter into um, maybe what, uh, what happens to some, some companies when they just try and go fast by using brute force, which isn't a, isn't a smart thing. So the 23 is going to take a lot of these um, innovations and improvements that we've seen from the likes of yourself and others, <laughs> David, um, you know, oh, oh, there's so many guys. I just mentioned there's those a bunch of like, us out there. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Definitely. So I'm, I'm always watching, kind of going, okay, how do I take this? How do we use this? How do we build this in? You know, what time do we have? How quickly can I make it happen? Um, yeah. Are people going to be interested in it? <laughs> Yes. Idea. And then does it work across all five models or is it, you know, can it only work in one? Yes, yeah. yes. Well, you know, I think if you are thinking about mini split, I, I think it's, it, I would say that's the best upgrade for me mm. as far as feature wise. So because mm. of my battery bank is so large, um, I don't know if you know, I don't use the um, propane water heating function. Mm use electricity i use the battery to warm up my um my hot water down right as right, such yeah. i don't carry uh, the large 20 uh 20 pound propane tanks that's gone as you know i i put mm. my air conditioner in front i only have a small 11 pound uh, propane tank in the uh escape storage box mm. and that i'm going on six months now i have not have to wow. fill it um i only use it for cooking mm-hmm. and so surprised I, you haven't gone to an induction top yet then <laughs> that's that's so <a>, that's <laughs> maybe a next uh you know next item um yeah there are so some I, very I, nice there are some very nice um because i've been looking at a lot of marine style equipment so i guess you're going to be familiar yes with some of these but i've been looking at a lot of marine stoves and um marine barbecues and these all these uh, these types of offerings that they have because they're usually very good quality yes um units um more pricey but i think when a person's buying a trailer like this and it's and the trailer itself is going to last for so long um they would like to have some really high quality or the option at least to have some really high quality um appliances in it that are well serviced and the marine industry kind of gives you that yes at same at the same time and i've been looking into some that some nice uh pretty looking should we say small form factor um induction units that the uh, marine guys are offering yeah I, now that's a good idea i i think you mentioned that they weren't uh csa well uh, only dickinson marine only dickinson well, there are others out there force 10 and, and that are CSA. csa okay. yes that are that are csa approved so i've been kind of going down that path recently with um, that's fantastic what else we can offer for people so that's great you know uh, it's i'm so excited to hear that you're always innovating and you mentioned about the 23 that's something i'm very interested in yeah uh-huh. uh, okay. i would love to do some crazy <laughs> that too, and uh you know bring it up to uh you know to a level that that i think it is deserving of the escape brand so wow yeah. wow well you know johnny we may have to uh May have to bend your ear when that comes around and see if you're interested. <laughs> oh, I, I'll have two trailers, right? <laughs> or maybe one, sell this one and move up to the twenty. Uh, you'll have, well, you know, you'll have no problem selling. So that's the uh, <laughs> that part's easy. <laughs> the innovating into the new one is the is the key. Yeah, the twenty three is going to be nice. We have an aluminum chassis for it, um, deeper chassis, um, different tanks going into it. Um, it's a different arrangement. It's a very different chassis style arrangement. It's much more akin to what I used to do on the um, on the trucking side 
um, mm-hmm. when I was working. Yeah, so you bring a glider in, you get everything into the glider. Um, you can sort of QA, you check the whole thing at a at a glider level, then slide it in, bring the top straight down, and mm-hmm. then everything plums, you know, goes goes straight up. But that's a it's a bit of a challenge in our industry because you know a lot of especially these smaller um, fiberglass manufacturers come from a mom and pop sort of um, a mom and pop shop the style. You know, should we say come from the um, an inventor. Um, entrepreneurial uh, sort of background, not necessarily from a, a strict engineering background. I mean, I like to say I'm, uh, you know, I, I tried to be an entrepreneur. I'm not an entrepreneur. N- I'm not, I'm not an entrepreneur. Put me in a room full of engineers. Maybe <laughs> I appear entrepreneurial. Put me in a room full of entrepreneurs. I'm the dunce. <laughs> I'm not going to make the grade at all. Um, but I am the guy who comes in after the entrepreneur. <laughs> That sort of it takes things forward and, and innovates, and that's kind of who I am. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. A lot of these mom and pop, a lot of the entrepreneurial development shops just don't have the um, the experience of dealing with modularity when it comes to builds. That's and modularity right. gives you repeatability, and repeatability gives you quality or the quality. ability to have a lot of quality. So, or quality built into the process or for what you're doing. So. Um, you know, when we, when we look at the Escape 23, we have the option, we have the opportunity now to build quality into the design process and make that match with the proposed manufacturing process. Right. right. So, um, you know, the 23 becomes the gateway to the next level of development on the Escape trailer, rest yeah. of the Escape trailer models as we push through. And that's going to take a few years for this to all kind of roll around. But I think it's going to be so interesting in a few years. And we build in all the solar technology, the the oh. energy storage, the advent of the real advent of electric vehicles, you know, fully takes off, which is only going to be in a few years, a few years time. Yeah, you know, it's it's all going to essentially, I, I think it's all going to come together in a few years. So you'll have started a lot of it. <laughs> Oh, oh goodness, gosh! I cannot take credit for that, but but I really like what you you're, you're talking the same language. You know, you're mm. talking about design for quality. So I'm an R and D engineer, and uh, there's a lot of time up front in mm. des- the design work. That's why our product takes five six years. Yeah. Um, you know, because we design for quality. You know, meeting the customer's requirement, then designing for you know quality to ensure that you know, the integrity, integrity of the, your uh, product uh, for the long run. So I, I think you are on the right foot. And then with that mindset, goodness, gosh, the sky's the limit for you guys, you know, as far as success um, and the following. Goodness. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so. Now you're already an ambassador. Yes. And you've I been am. showing and you've been showing your trailer off. We know yes, that. I- <laughs> <laughs> and I know you had somebody in yesterday or this morning, was it a yesterday? Uh, yesterday, yeah. <laughs> yesterday. You had somebody in yesterday. So that's continuing to go, which is which is good. Um, you know, I, I thought, I mean, obviously with COVID, we there was a huge uptake in trailers and our backlog was pushed out really far. Um and I really thought it would start to drop off. Oh my god, it's gotta drop off. I mean, people aren't gonna keep going further and further out into 23 placing orders, but <laughs> it's still no. crazy. It's still crazy, and that, of course, is also a testament to the um, to the brand and the quality as Absolutely. well. Because I think what's happened is now people people have started to really look at the RV industry. We really started to look at trailers, and especially when there's new people coming into the trailers. So when when it's new people looking for RVs, they 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 do a lot more research, and there's a lot more opportunity for them to gain valuable information on the on the web. These yep. days, whether it's the Facebook page or the forum page or our new forum page, it's, it's all it's all there's lots of really good quality information. And I I think what people are doing is they're they're voting with their um you know they're voting with their dollars now. They're saying, you know, I want a good quality, good value trailer. I don't want the cheapest thing that's out there. I want something that I know I can invest in, use, and sell if this isn't the lifestyle for me, and it'll be okay, right? Um, well, it, it's a testament in that, and I'm I'm on the Facebook forum, and my goodness, uh, the escape trailers are selling like the used market is selling like hotcakes, mm-hmm. and in fact, uh, the owners are saying, "My goodness, I'm 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 uh, getting what I 
paid for, yeah. uh, you know, originally. That what an investment. Where are you going to get, uh, you know, the, something that you use for two, three years and then sell it for what you pay for? Yeah, uh, that's incredible. Free holidaying in a way. <laughs> yeah, it's it's uh, I, it's uh, I, I'm just very uh, you know, just in shocked in that this um used trailer market is so hot it's uh, particularly escape so yeah. yeah 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 i think you find it with the other ones too um you know oliver is a oliver is a lovely trailer casita make a very nice trailer you know scamp as well so you you know those guys then of course there's armadillo and there's there's bigfoot and there's happier camper which are down sort of more yes. down your way as well i mean that's much more of a boat build much more like the um oliver the sort of trailer trailerism and you know I, you know from my perspective it's like and I've said this before on on different Q and A's and and things. It's uh, in 2019 there was 275,000 tow trailers sold in North America. Yes. Just and that's just bumper pulls. That's not including fifth wheels, right? right? Or class E's or class B's or any of the, the motorhome styles. Just tow, just bumper pulls. This year they're expecting that to be just under 500,000. <laughs> going out now if i take the entire fiberglass industry together i would be surprised if there's more than six thousand trailers going i think i might have said 10 as an absolute max so uh, my point is the fiberglass industry we kind of all need to stick together yes because there's more than enough for everybody and we can take those other four hundred ninety thousand people and say <laughs> you really ought to be considering buying a really good quality trailer let's move <laughs> them all over to the fiberglass <laughs> to the fiberglass <laughs> industry well, Johnny, I think we're, I'm pretty much out of battery on this side. <laughs> <laughs> I just jumped down to jumped down to 9%, but I've really taken up a lot of your time today. Oh, I, no. I, 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 I love speaking with you. I, I think this is just, um, it's just a great exercise for us. And, um, you know, really appreciate all the work that you've done on your trail. I really appreciate you being an ambassador. Oh gosh, my the word for people. I love talking about my escape. On yeah. escape. And, you know, I really hope, um, you know, we can get down California way and at some point maybe bump into you on a rock climb or oh, I, won't be climbing. I won't be climbing, but I can certainly pull a rope <laughs> and I can probably <laughs> hold your weight pretty good. So <laughs> just in case, if you're climbing with ropes, that is, you're not doing oh, an, Alex, an Alex Honnold or something. <laughs> oh my goodness. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm not that crazy, but hey, I would love to, uh, to attend a real escape rally up yeah. uh, your way. Uh, hopefully maybe next year. For sure. So, yep. yeah, yeah, we're bucking it up now. So hopefully that'll happen. It'll be the last weekend in May, I believe. So next after, year. after after we have Victoria Day here, which is the DC. So right. holding. So after that, um, that's that's when we'll have it. Perfect. Okay, Johnny. Listen, we're going to run out of battery here. Um, again, thanks very much. Good talking to you. All right, everybody. Listen, Johnny. Thanks very much for for all your time today. Uh, we're going to finish it up here. We're Escape Trailer, and we're built for you.